Okay. So let's get started. Hi, everyone. Thank you so much for coming. Um, we are here because uh, we are celebrating the release of my book, Pet, The Journey from Abuse to Recovery. Um, it's a book of poetry that I wrote. Um, and if for some reason you don't know a lot about my work, um, my name is Kella. I'm a writer from Eugene, Oregon. Um, I uh, I primarily write nonfiction. I wrote this book of poetry, um, but I also um, I write a lot of creative nonfiction. I write educational material. I specialize in writing about um, mental health um, and chronic illness and disability, things like that. Um, but I wrote a book, and so we're here, and um, I want to share some of the poems um, in the book with you. Um, and uh, so what's going to happen here is um, is basically I'm going to read a set of poems um, from the new book, um, and then I'm going to read um, a handful of poems um, from that, that are not in the book, and we're actually going to have some cool multimedia things happening. We're going to uh, share some uh, recordings of uh, music performances and also dance performances. So that's going to be cool. Um, and then um, about uh, an hour in, we're going to transition to a Q&A session. So if you have any questions uh, for me about the book or my work in general, um, that'll be an opportunity to ask them. Um, so first thing, um, I wanted to talk about um, why I decided to write this book um, and sort of some of the story about how it got written. Um, and that story, story starts uh, over 10 years ago. I was in an abusive relationship and uh, getting out of that abusive relationship happened to coincide um, with the pop star Rihanna going on national television to talk about her relationship with Chris Brown and how it had turned abusive. Um, and I found it incredibly moving to see her talk about something so vulnerable in such a public way. Um, and at the time, I knew that I had a unique ability, uh, particularly through poetry, to take um, emotions and concepts and sort of translate them into something more tangible um, through, uh, through words, through writing. And I realized that because... Um, my abuse situation was sort of unique in some ways, that I was uh, uniquely situated to um, both share this sort of strange experience that I had had um, and um, and have that be a compelling thing, but also uh, the universality of it, that um, unfortunately domestic abuse is incredibly common. Um, and that in in writing about that, that I would be able to translate those experiences, both for people who hadn't been through them, um, but also for uh, for people that had and to validate those experiences for them. Um, so I knew I wanted to write poems about what I had been through pretty much as soon as I was able to call it abuse. I knew that. Um, but at the time, I was in a really uh, financially um, unstable uh, position. I was couch surfing, just staying wherever anyone would let me. Um, I didn't have a job. And, um, and so it was a few months before I was able to write again, before I had enough stability to do that. Um, the very first poem that I wrote was three pages long. <laughs> it was just sort of spewing out all of the words, all of the feelings onto the page, just get it out there. Um, and uh, and eventually that poem did get edited down to the point where um, it could be in the book, but it was just a mess in the very beginning. Um, and the second poem that I wrote, um, I wrote it after talking to some friends of mine when I was trying to explain to them why the relationship had been painful. Um, I knew that the relationship was dysfunctional and that it had harmed me, but I didn't really have words to explain why that was yet. And I was lying in bed one night trying to figure out how to describe this. And the words that were coming into my head started sort of forming themselves into lines and then into stanzas. And I was like, oh, this is a poem. I have to write this down right now. Um, so I jumped out of bed. I grabbed a pen and paper. I wrote it all down so I wouldn't forget it. Um, and from that day for the next like three months, I was writing poems constantly. I had to have pen and paper around all of the time or else um, I would forget a poem. And um, there were some days where I was writing three poems a day and the vast majority of those poems ended up in the finished book. Um, so it was a very, a very cathartic time. 
Um, then after three months, it like slowed down some and on and off over the next like three or four years, I continued to write poems that clearly went with this collection. Um, I, as I went through the sort of different stages of healing and processing what had happened to me and gaining more understanding of what I had been through, I had more to say about it. I had a deeper understanding. Um, and so I had more to write about it and that took some time. Um, and um, at some point I had a book, I knew that it all went together um, into one sort of story. Um, and I did explore the option of traditional publishing. I did um, submit it to a few poetry contests um, as a book, but uh, I wasn't super familiar with the process of uh, submitting to publications and I wasn't super confident at that time. So, uh, so I just kind of shelved that project for a few years. I had other things that I was working on um, and then a couple years ago, um, I uh, started thinking about the option of self-publishing. Uh, and mainly the reason I started considering that was because I realized self-publishing is far more accessible than it used to be. Um, the main barrier to self-publishing is marketing, is trying to find people to, to buy your book. Um, because if you don't have any kind of um, pre-existing audience, you are just sort of shoving your book in into the hands of friends and family and going, eh, buy my book. Um, and that only goes so far. So, um, but uh, because I have my blog that I've been running for about five years now, I have a pre-established audience. And I knew that uh, because of the content of my blog, that it was likely that my audience would be interested in the topic of this book. Um, so that's how I decided uh, to self-publish. And then about two years later, there's a book. It's all done. <laughs> um, and so uh, this book, I did everything in this book. Uh, I, you know, in addition to writing the poems, I formatted it. I illustrated the cover and designed the cover. This book is uh, is really my baby. It's it's a very special thing. So if you don't already own a copy for some reason, um, you can uh, you can buy it. The link should be in the chat. Um, it's uh, books to read.com slash yap voice pet. Uh, I have both um, print and ebook options available if um, if you would like to buy one. So um, before I get into the actual um, poetry reading part, um, I wanted to start with something. Let me get my thing set up there. There we go. Um, I wanted to um, start by saying um, the concept of trigger warnings is uh, or content notes is highly controversial within the poetry community. Um, and I think that the primary reason that that's the case is because uh, the main purpose of poetry specifically is to provoke big emotion. And I think some people think the idea of a trigger warning is sort of pointless um, if uh, if you're going into reading a poem in order to experience those large emotions. Um, I don't necessarily agree with that. Um, but I do uh, sort of want to reframe my content note for, for this reading. And that is to say, um, this poetry was always written with the intention to make the emotions and the experiences around abuse and, uh, and the aftermath of abuse as real and as tangible as possible. Um, and so that means that reading the poems, listening to the poems requires an openness to those feelings. Um, so that includes um, there are both uh, literal and metaphorical um, graphic depictions of domestic abuse, of uh, sexual abuse, of self-harm and um, uh, metaphorical um, imagery of violence by firearm. Um, so any, if any of those subjects are sensitive to you or you know, just if you have big feelings, um, I encourage you to, uh, to be in a place where you feel safe be, and that you can be centered, give yourself some grace if big emotions come up um, and, um, and we can just go through these, these emotions together. So that is my um, sort of reframed content note um, for the context of poetry. Um, so to start, um, the I'm going to read um, the very first poem um, in the book, which is called Cotton. Um, and, uh, and it starts actually before part one starts. So this is Cotton. You told me not to say bad things about you 
but somehow I couldn't. Every good word I said, twisted out of my grasp, became a bad one. That is all they heard. To stop my words from turning on you, I took cotton balls, stuffed them down my throat. All my words got caught in cotton, built up. Of you, I said little. You're gone, the cotton in the words still in my throat. Whenever I speak of you, the words won't come. So the reason that this poem um, is at the beginning of the book is, uh, is because it is about the experience of trying to talk about abuse, of trying to let the words out. Um, and um, this book is what happened when the cotton came out. This book is what happened when the words came out. Um, so it is, um, it's kind of the prelude um, to, to the book. Um, and um, right after Cotton, we start with part one, which is called Repression, which uh, sort of starts you right in the middle of the nightmare of abuse, not at the beginning of the relationship, but when the, the abuse has already escalated and it's already to the point where your normals are completely skewed and you don't really know what's happening anymore. Um, and so I'm going to go to actually just the second poem um, in the book, um, which is called uh, Submissive. You see the rebellion on my face. Down on my knees, you press my face into your sweaty lap, shortening my breath till I cry, till I give in. Struggling to shrink, to be a shining shell. Clean your counter, these dishes, cook, sweep, smile, massage, go hungry. In a weak moment, I risk feeling I can't shove myself in this box anymore. You throw me to the street in my heels and nylons, my thoughts broadcast across my forehead, the wrong tone, a word, something I say gives me away. When you call and grant me a second chance, I'll come, but I pray that next time I'll let go of myself. No conscious soul can do what you ask. So um, next, I wanted to go into, I wanted to um, introduce um, the source of the title of the book, Pet. Um, and so this poem is called um, Ghost Lines Act One. There is also an act two in the book. Um, and this poem is written in the form of a script. It's, um, it's a conversation um, between Sir and Pet. Sir starts the conversation. When I say good girl, I want you to say thank you, sir. Yes, sir. Good girl. Thank you, sir. Sir, there is a problem that requires your attention. If you're going to do this, do it right, pet. Okay. I'm sorry, sir. Sir, may I speak with you? I guess. Sir, there is a problem that requires your attention. If it's not too much trouble... I'd appreciate your assistance very much. Fine. What's the problem, pet? Here's what you asked for, sir. I guess you don't really want to be here. I'm sorry, sir? This is it? This is the money you're going to give me? Yes, sir. That's all that was left. You really expect me to believe that it cost that much? I didn't think you'd steal, pet. Not from me. I didn't. I promise. Silence. I think you decided you'd rather go home than stay here with me and get better. No, sir, I want to get better. I want to stay. Please don't make me go. So that is where the title of the book, Pet, comes from. Um, and uh, next we have um, the poem, which is also called Pet. What can they think when they see me? Tight silk skirt, four inch heels, lacy bra, plunging neckline, long rips in my nylon stockings. Every week I come with heaps of laundry, cotton boxers, denim jeans that could swallow me whole. Every week, handfuls of quarters, sticky with detergent. 
only $1.50 per wash, $1.25 on Tuesdays. Every week before I leave, I carefully fold each item hot from the dryer. No one speaks to me. Perhaps they see my leash snaking across the tiles, trailing out the door. I am surely not far from my owner. So next, before I read the next poem, um, I wanted to talk about something that I think um, adds uh, another big layer of meaning to, um, to the poems, to the book itself. Um, a lot of you already know this about me, but some of you may not. Um, I have struggled with mental health issues pretty much my whole life. Um, and in August of 2020, I was evaluated for dissociative disorders. Um, and I was ultimately diagnosed with dissociative identity disorder. Uh, what this means is that when I experience trauma or high levels of stress, uh, rather than just dissociating from the emotions or from uh, the memories or from the physical sensations um, in the moment, I dissociate from my identity. I dissociate from who I was at the time that that experience happened. Um, and so as a result, new identities split off. In each of these identities, we operate independently of one another. Um, we all have um, our own preferences and interests and values and goals um, and uh, ideas about what keeps us safe. Um, but ultimately, this was actually a very good thing, this diagnosis. Um, this was a positive development for me um, for, uh, for two reasons. One is because um, I suddenly had a framework that I could use to, uh, to understand uh, all of these life experiences that I had that I had never understood before. There were many confusing, disorienting things that I had experienced and felt that I could not explain, that therapists couldn't explain to me, and that finally I had the words for. And, um, and I also had the tools for how to deal with them when they, when they came up again. I knew how to actually uh, help the problem rather than just sort of working around it all of the time. Um, and then the second reason that this diagnosis was really positive um, was because uh, when I became um, open about the fact that um, that I am one of many identities, that I am part of what's called a system, which is what uh, refers to the collection of identities, um, that uh, that we no longer had to pretend to be one identity anymore, um, that we could uh, express ourselves individually, that each of us could expand or express ourselves authentically, um, rather than everyone just trying to pretend to be me all of the time, because that was, that was very draining. Um, and so, uh, being able to express ourselves as ourselves and our, and allow us, us to be different from one another, um, has been, um, has been very liberating for us. Um, why is all of this relevant to the poetry reading? Well, um, because uh, because I've had this disorder basically my entire life, um, all of my experiences, particularly the uh, the extremely emotional ones, have been experienced through the lens of DID. Um, and so this book, when I wrote it, was a detailed accounting of uh, of the progression of my emotions through um, through the process of abuse and its aftermath. And even though I had no idea that um, that I had DID, I had no idea that I had this collection of identities that were working together, and um, and th that was influencing my mental health at the time um, of going through the abuse and writing it. Um, I see DID in this book everywhere. Um, there are a lot of poems that are uh, that are about dissociation, and um, there are uh, there are several poems that are about uh, feeling a lack of autonomy, feeling a lack of, of control over my own body, over my own voice, like something is preventing me from, um, from speaking, from doing what I want to do. Um, and there are even several specific mentions um, of alters, which is the technical name for these identities, of, of specific members of my system um, in, the, in the, the poems. And so I didn't know about these alters at the time that I wrote the poems, but I was describing what I saw in my mind. I was describing 
um, the emotions I was feeling and the most tangible way I could describe them was personifying them because that's what they were in my mind was they were people. Um, and so I think that that um, having that background knowledge really adds a lot to this book, especially um, if you're not familiar with the idea at all. Um, and so there were a few poems that I wanted to in particular point out um, how uh, the knowledge of DID adds to its meaning. Um, so the next poem I wanted to read um, is called Two in the Morning. Um, this is probably the darkest poem in the book. Um, so remember my content warning. Um, it's particularly applicable in this one. Two in the morning. Get out of bed. Redress the way he likes it. Put on your coat. Slowly kill yourself. Your skin is vulnerable in night air. The world has begun to close over you. The awareness gets heavier and heavier until your body can't hold it. Pretend to go back to sleep. Parts of you have begun to fall off. Ears, fingers, a shoulder, a breast. They litter the path to his house. Knock on the door, your heart pounding, knowing your lover is waiting, a gun in hand. Spread your broken body for him and shut your eyes before the bullet leaves the gun. So this poem obviously is moving on its own, um, but this poem is unique in a specific way. And I didn't notice this uniqueness until after the diagnosis. Um, this book was um, intentionally written in the same tense all the way through. And the pronouns I and you always refer to the same people. I always refers to me um, and you always refers to my abuser, um, except in this poem. This poem is the, is the one exception. In this poem, you refers to me. And because someone else is speaking, is speaking to me. And I think that uh, that pronoun change really indicates that this poem represents when the dissociation was really at its height during these experiences, when when the abuse was at some of its worst, worst and the level of dissociation that was required in order to get through that, um, that someone else in my system was coaching me through the motions that I needed to go through, that I wasn't even really making these decisions myself. I was following someone else's instructions and just and kind of robotically doing it. Um, and so I think that that's that's a really interesting um, added layer of of meaning to um, to an already powerful poem. Um, also, uh, going back to the DID stuff, I wanted to mention um, that because um, uh, because we are a collection of identities. That also means that when we work on creative projects, um, we do that. Uh, we do that collaboratively. That we're all that we're all participating in it. We're all working on it. Um, and so this book was absolutely a collaboration in our system. And um, the the world doesn't really make it easy to give credit to um, to system members because the world is organized in um, expecting each person to have one identity, <laughs> because most people do. Not everyone, but most people do. Um, and uh, so it's much easier for me to just put my name, Kella Hanawain, on a creative project and let that represent it. Um, but the truth is, there were many people in our system that were involved in making this book, and I just wanted to take a moment to mention some of them um, and what they did. So in addition to myself, um, Amy was also particularly involved in writing the poems. Um, the editing was um, the editing of the poems over the years was primarily handled by Hazel and later uh, by Jessica. Um, the the art, the illustration on the front and the the cover design was absolutely led by AJ, uh, Billy, and Shelby. Um, and um, the decision to self publish uh, involved a lot of counseling from um, from Holly and Wendy. They really helped me with that decision. So um, so this book. Um, is a labor of love from all of us, really. And I wanted to make sure that um, that they are also acknowledged in that. Hi, this is Amy. Um, I was uh, editing the video and I realized that we forgot to mention in our section about giving credit to everyone in our system um, that at the beginning of our book, there's a dedication page and um, it says for Amy, me, 
uh, Sylvia, Susan, and Casey, and that's referring to um, the four of us that were created as a direct result of the abusive relationship. So that's what our dedication page is. And um, speaking of um, of the illustration on this book, um, this uh, the illustration on this book is so special um, and and really speaks for itself, uh, even separate from from the poetry. And so um, we decided to get prints of it made. And so this is just a standard sort of artboard print of it. Um, and um, we have other prints available. We have um, framed prints and larger poster prints and um, canvas prints and all of those um, are available on our um, on our Redbubble store. Um, uh, we're gonna put a link in the chat to, um, to that selection of products. Um, so if you would like to have um, your own piece of art of of that cover, if that cover moves you, um, you can own your own version of it. Um, okay, now back to poetry. Um, so this next poem, I think, is another um, another one that is a good um, a good representation of of what dissociation feels like. This poem is called Pinprick. For you, I sew my hand into a piece of mending. The silver point pokes through the fabric, pierces my fingertip, emerges below my nail. A straight stitch through five fleshy digits, a clean pattern like a star. The thread wiped clean with a bloody rag, I continue, I continue along my arm, the outer seams of my body. Covered in tiny holes, I can't understand why my heart won't let me sleep. This next poem, um, uh, I think I'll, I'll read it and then I'll and then I'll talk about why I included it. This poem is called um, "Breath of Who We Could Be." I don't remember what led up to it, why we were suddenly laid bare, making love so unexpected, our rough edges chafing. Love me, I said. I love you, I love you, I love you, you said. Words surrendered for a moment. I wanted to include that poem both in this book and in the reading um, specifically because I think that, um, I think we often forget that um, even in the worst parts of an abusive relationship, those moments um, of mm, tenderness and warmth do still exist. Um, and if they didn't, the relationship wouldn't continue. You know, there there is something that keeps you there. There is something that keeps your hope alive, um, that things can be different, that things can be better. Um, and it's not just nightmare all of the time. Um, and so I thought that that poem was um, an important uh, important reminder of that. Um, oh, and then before I read the next poem, I wanted to, to tell a little story. So something that's unique about this book um, is that um, it really lends itself to be being read sequentially. Um, that's not very typical for poetry books. Uh, most poetry books, you tend to sort of flip through them and read a poem here, read a poem there. Um, but this book really, um, really asks you to start from the beginning and read all the way through to the end. Um, it's got um it's got a clear narrative it's not chronological but it has a clear progression um through uh through a story um and so at this point in the story um of um of this relationship um there was um there i had an argument with my ex um and he was uh withholding money from me that i needed in order to pay rent and so i was in a crisis and i didn't know what to do um, and uh, I was able to reach out to a family friend uh, named Cameron, um, and she did two absolutely brilliant things when she heard what our situation was. Um, the first thing she did was she offered to lend me the money to cover rent, so immediately de-escalated the situation. Um, and then the second thing that she did, um, many other people had tried to convince me that the relationship was abusive. Um, and had not succeeded. That's very common. It's really common for victims to not listen to that um, for good reasons. Um, 
Uh, but she did not try to do this. Instead, what she did was she said, I'm concerned that the patterns that you're learning in this relationship might uh, have negative impact on your future relationships. This is absolutely brilliant because it takes the criticism off of the current relationship, off of the person that you're currently in love with, and puts it onto theoretical relationships, onto people that you haven't met yet, that you don't have an attachment to. Um, and so uh, this really helped reframe things in my brain and get me to listen to her. Um, and one of the things that she recommended that I do was to spend some time thinking about what I wanted in the relationship um, that I I was constantly focused on what he wanted, what what I needed to do to fix things. Um, and uh, she encouraged me to to instead focus on on what do you want out of this? Um, and so I did that. I took some time away from the relationship to think about that. Um, and then ultimately, I decided to go back. I decided that I wanted to to, um, to try again with the relationship. I still had hope. Um, and um, but something had changed because I had taken the time to consider what I wanted out of this relationship. Um, suddenly, I was looking at the current relationship and comparing the two of them. I was I was seeing the ways that what I wanted and what was actually happening were different. Um, and what resulted from that was there started being sort of cracks in the facade. Um, I started noticing things uh, and um, moments of of uh, hypocrisy and and um, that kind of thing. Um, so this next poem is from uh, is from that phase. So this poem is called "Stupid Bitch." You hand me this name. Insist it suits me. I try to put it on. Drape it over my shoulders. Tie it around my waist. Put one leg in at a time. Brown. I cannot. It does not fit. So I love the sass with that one. <laughs> it's, it's very good. Um, so next, um, I'm going to move into um, part two of the book. Part two is called Recovery. Um, and this uh, looks at the sort of immediate healing after after leaving the relationship. Um, and so um, immediately after I left the relationship, I didn't um, I didn't recognize that I had been abused right away. It took me a while to be able to see things that way. And um, I don't remember. Um, uh, when I first sort of recognized this, I don't remember the dream that I had, but I remember waking up from a dream and uh, and writing in my journal, what if the person that you trusted the most was the one that was hurting you all along? And this realization was so big and sort of earth shattering um, that I couldn't deal with it at, at the time. And so I actually, I pushed it away. Um, and a few months later, I had it again. <laughs> I had the same sort of um, revelation uh, that what I had experienced was a betrayal of trust. Um, and this was the poem that I wrote um, after the second time that I had that realization. This is called The Turn. Always looking for the sun, I got lost. When we first met, I could tell by the color of your hair, gold inside and out, you knew the sun intimately. You promised me we'd see it. In a sky so large, I saw it, a fire belly just above the sea. I loved you for leading me there. You turned my path away from the sun. You pushed me toward the blue glass beneath. You led me into the shallows deepening until the tide crashed over my body. You never told me that in order to reach the sun, I had to drown. So that's an important moment in, in that healing process. Next poem um, I wanted to read is actually one of my favorite poems from the book. Um, it's called Blades. Um, and, um, and first I'll, uh, I'll tell the story of how this poem, uh, was created. So, um, 
I went to see um, a musical um, with a friend of mine. And after the musical was over, we went uh, into the lobby and um, I saw my ex in the lobby. And this was the first time that I had seen him since I had um, that recognition happen, since I had that change of perspective of, oh, you were the one who harmed me. Um, and we made eye contact and a lot happened in those few moments of eye contact. It was only for like three, five seconds, but a ton happened. Um, and I spent like a week thinking about those five seconds of eye contact. And I, and I wanted to write a poem about it. And this poem became like a puzzle. Like I was pulling apart how, um, what all of the pieces were of what had happened and trying to describe it, trying to understand it. Um, so this is the poem uh, that came out of that process. It's called Blades. That old mix of poisons, hate and lust tear through my veins. Seeing you again, you back me up against a wall, body pressed against mine, knife at my throat, you dare me to speak. I want to taste poison in my body once more. I glint with steel of my own. You see me answer, yes, I dare. It's a good one, good one. Um, not to toot my own horn, but. Um, and then I'm gonna move on into part three. Um, which is uh, called Retrospect. Um, and so this section is about um, the part of the healing process that we went through where um, we were looking back at the beginning of the relationship and kind of going, what happened? How did we get here? How did we get from something that uh, felt so loving and warm and trusting and progress to this nightmare? What were the signs? What did I miss? Um, and, uh, and so this section is going back to the beginning of the relationship and watching that sort of slow decline, um, into, uh, into the land of abuse. So the first poem from, um, from part three is called Black Flyers. The moment before I say I love you, a storm cloud descends on my body. The darkness is so close, I can't see the space before my eyes. The air crackles with the promise of lightning, and dry rain drenches my face. Words trembling in my chest, I'm afraid the snipers will shoot through the folds of darkness, shatter each syllable into pieces too small to hold. The longer I hide in deafening emptiness, the closer they come. The words fly without breath, the air clears. I give you the storm. Each time I touch you, I can feel it still. This next poem um, is uh, special in multiple ways. Um, and I'm going to read it first and then, um, and then tell you about the multiple reasons that, that it's special. So this poem is called My Love. I'm afraid to tell you how I see you in the pink awakenings of the horizon in the gold stretching and blooming of the sky. I feel the words float to the surface. They press against my lips and then I feel the beast behind my shoulder. Whiskers brush against my neck. The beast holds my throat as he wraps me in a woolen cloak of fear. I could run to you and offer up my life. My ribs spread wide for an easy reach let you take my heart between your hands. But what if you too craved meat? What if your nails scraped behind my heart, pulled it loose from its fleshy wall, and I was left with deathly stillness, the gaping silence of an abandoned house? So, two reasons that this poem is special. Um, the first one, if you have the book, you'll see that there's a little symbol uh, next to the title. And uh, what that symbol means is that this is the one and only poem in the book that was written while the relationship was still happening. 
um, I was in a poetry class at the time, uh, and um, and I wrote this poem, and um, I intended it to sort of convey what I already saw as my sort of messed up relationship with love, um, and uh, and I remember reading it in my poetry class and um, and getting feedback. Um, and you're supposed to stay quiet during the feedback. And everyone was like, well, this person is clearly in an abusive relationship. And I was like, no, I'm not. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but so it's really interesting that, um, that the level of, um, of darkness that's in this poem was present, um, that my understanding of the relationship was already, um, was already this dark, was already this full of um, distrust and sort of twisted things. Um, so that's one reason that it's special. The second reason that it's special um, is um, going back to um, the DID stuff. Uh, this um, this section right here, I'm going to reread, says, I feel the beast behind my shoulder, whiskers brush against my neck. The beast holds my throat as he wraps me in a woolen cloak of fear. When I read this poem, um, the first time after I got the diagnosis, my first thought when I read it was, oh my God, that's Oberon. Oberon is the name of an altar in my system. And he uh, he used to do a lot of this sort of holding back, this, this sort of, um, no, you can't do that. No, that's not safe. Um, don't say that, don't do that. Um, and um, Oberon also happens to be um, the one member of my system who is non-human. That's actually very common in DID systems. Um, DID is formed in childhood. And so a lot of children will create altars based on supernatural or fantasy creatures um, as, uh, as a way of protection of sort of, if I were magic, um, then I would be protected from what's happening to me. Um, so, uh, so Oberon is non-human, so the characterization of him as a beast is, is, um, very accurate. Um, and so again, it was fascinating. I wrote this poem more than 10 years before I knew about Oberon, before I knew about my system, but he is there. That is him in the poem. Um, so I thought that was very cool. Um, and then before we take a break, I have one more poem. Um, this actually is not in the book. Um, but I wanted to read another poem that I also wrote while in the relationship. It's it's a poem of a similar nature, again, sort of exploring my relationship to love at the time. Um, and so this poem is called Love Poem. I want to lift your punching bag body, sling your bicep over my shoulder, and carry your weight all day. I want to, to break open your skull and see the crumbling of gold inside. I want to wear a black silk skirt that barely reaches my thighs. Let you watch my nylons stretch in 30 degree weather. I want to swallow your cotton shirt and feel comfort fill my stomach. I want to string myself up and let you bat and lunge at my paper mache torso, searching for the candy inside. I want you to find me crumpled and limp, take this weight away from me, with just your animal strength. I want to bake you a chocolate cake and fold these words into the batter, but you're allergic to wheat and to my chocolate lies. Next poem that I would like to read uh, is um, the last poem in, um, in part three. Um, and um, this poem, is called Date Night. Going out, I'm like a skeleton. Ants crawl along the sidewalk, along the ridges of my bones, beneath old flaps of skin. Wind rocks my precarious body, unstable on bird feet. You do not take my hand, not during dinner. No skin to hide behind, I ruin the meal ants crawling out of my chest. I didn't want to go out. You decide it will be best if we stay in from now on. So that poem kind of signifies the transition from a dysfunctional relationship into a fully abusive relationship into uh, the relationship becoming um, more uh, more fully isolated. Um, 
And so that's why it's at the end of part three. Um, and then we go into part four, um, which is called resilience. And so resilience is about sort of the longer term healing, the, the larger picture reflections um, on the process of healing on abuse as a larger issue in society. Um, and uh, the first poem in, um, in resilience is called, How Could She Stay With Him? Someone took down his wooden signs, high treason and Buddhist prostitutes. Only a simple hand-painted antichrist is left. When police took him away, the neighbors came out to watch, drawn like vultures by his shouts. They say he tried to push her down the stairs. She misses him, I know. Even as I ask myself, I know. A garden, a household, a life, left to be tended alone. A space empty of corruption is still empty. At first, it does not matter what you choose to fill it with. Uh, I have a little story to go with that poem. So that poem was, was written about um, a neighbor that lived down the street from me. I didn't know her. Um, but I sort of saw the events unfolding from afar. Um, but uh, a few years later, um, I had this poem actually published through um, uh, a publisher called Architrave Press. Um, and uh, they specialize in um, sort of elevated typography um, and formatting of poems, and then they sell prints of the poems. And so part of my payment for this poem um, was, um, was a selection of prints that I could sell myself. Um, and um, I had a, uh, a showing of my poems um, at, uh, at the local store, Capella Market. I used to work there. Um, and, um, and this was one of the poems. And I put a note next to it saying that there were prints available for sale. Um, and I found out that there was a customer that wanted one. Um, and so I met up with him. And I was very surprised when I met him because he was a regular. And I never would have guessed that this content would resonate with him. I never would have guessed that this is something that would be significant to him. Um, and I remember him saying something to me about um, how I had really, uh, I had really captured that set of feelings that that um, that it was very meaningful to him. Um, and I remember saying something along the lines of, "You're welcome. I'm sorry." <laughs> Um, because on the one hand, you know, I had offered him this validation, this reflection, um, but on the other hand, it is a sad thing to know that someone else has been through the same painful experience. Um, uh, but, uh, but that experience really sort of taught me that, um, you just never know what someone has been through. You just never know when someone has had experiences like this or, or like anything traumatic, really. Um, and, um, and so I just always remember that from, from this poem. This next poem, um, is called, uh, Locked Inside Your House. It's hard for me not to look, to see myself as I walk by. I look because I always do. Where you used to live is a pit the size of four buildings deep walls of dirt carved in the ground, like God's hand reached down, uprooted your house, and crushed it in his fingers. The destruction of your house does not stop you. I know you still exist. But as I look at the remains of your house, the haunted feeling I used to have begins to disappear, something like normality replacing it. My feelings begin to seem less real, existing only in my head and yours. But that, I hate to admit, was true all along. It was just a house. To me, its decimation was merited. I am going to read um, one more poem from the book, and then we're going to transition to non-book poems. Um, so uh, this is the second to last poem. Uh, poem in the book. And um, this poem um, has a, a big story attached to it um, that I wanted to share with you. Um, so 
uh, in order to um, sort of contextualize um, this poem, this poem probably gains the most from the knowledge of the DID diagnosis. Um, and in order to understand that, I want to sort of back up, um, explain a little bit more about DID and about my system specifically. Um, so in DID, there's something called um, the inner world. And the inner world is basically a, uh, a visual representation in your mind of where alters go when they're not fronting. Um, and so alters can talk to each other there. Um, there, um, the inner world can look like lots of different settings. You can create new settings. Um, there's a lot of different healing that you can actually do in the inner world because it's basically um, a uh, a visual metaphor for what's going on with you emotionally. Um, and uh, in in our system, um, the very first alter to split off in our system was AJ. Um, and not that long after she split off, um, Oberon, who I mentioned before, made the decision to lock her up in the inner world so that she could not interact with the rest of the system, she could not front, uh, she couldn't interact with the outside world at all, and she was just completely isolated. And she stayed that way for the majority of our lives. Um, Oberon did this because at the time, he believed that AJ's personality was, was potentially dangerous to the system. He believed that she was too rebellious, too defiant, um, and that to be safe, we needed to be quiet and accepting. Um, Oberon has since uh, regretted this decision and amended it, um, but, um, but it happened. Um, fast forward uh, to the last day that I was in this abusive relationship. I had no plans to leave on that day. Um, if anything, um, there was an argument that had broken out and I was doubling down on my sort of submissive te tendencies and my commitment to do whatever he wanted me to do. Um, and then my memory blacked out for five minutes. And this wasn't normal for me. I, I didn't normally experience um, amnesia even during traumatic events. Um, and then even more importantly, when I came to after those five minutes, I had already decided to leave. I was on my way out the door. And for years, this experience haunted me because I didn't understand how it was possible that I could not, um, I could not remember why I left the relationship, what my reason was for deciding to leave. That didn't make any sense to me, um, but I didn't remember. Um, and so this is something I puzzled over for a long time. And then on one particular day, I was reflecting on this question. Um, and the only way that I can describe it was that I had a vision. Um, and immediately after this vision, I wrote this poem. It's called Gap. I don't remember the five minutes before I left. I remember hearing him say, how could you do this to me? And the next memory is walking toward the door, my fragile mind made up. After many years, I asked the deepest corners of my mind, what happened during those five minutes? To my surprise, I received an answer. I went back in time. I found old me walking alone on my way to his house. I took my hand and said, it's going to be okay. You're going to get through this. Hang on, you'll get there one day, I promise. I went back in time. I visited myself one night when I was trying to sleep. My horrible futon made my muscles stiff. My old pillow made my neck ache. Someday, I told me, I'll get you a comfortable bed, a better pillow, I promise. I went back in time to the night that I left. I walked up to myself, took my hands in mine, looked my old self in the eye and said, it's time to go. But, but I don't want to, I said beginning to cry. I don't want to leave. I took me in my arms and said, I know. I love him. I love him so much, I said. I kissed my forehead. I know, but it's time. I reached into my pocket and placed a set of old keys gently into my hand. You have been caged, little bird, I said. These let you out. Fly away. And so I did. The reason that DID is related to this poem is because after the diagnosis, I learned uh, that 
during this um, during this argument, when I was doubling down on my submissiveness, Oberon recognized that if we did not leave the relationship at that moment, we never would, and that we would be in a lot of danger if that was the case. Um, he also recognized that all of us were programmed to accept, to go along with what he wanted, to none of us had the capacity to sort of disrupt the social dynamic that we had with him that would be necessary in order to leave. None of us, except for AJ. AJ was the only one that could do it. And so Oberon made the decision to let her out um, and allow her to French for five minutes. And so I blocked out for five minutes so that AJ uh, could make the decision to leave and get us moving out the door. And that's actually one of the primary dia diagnostic criteria for DID is to experience um, amnesia while another altar is fronting. And you don't have to experience that all the time. I don't, um, but you do have to have a history of it. Um, and so that is why my memory blacked out. And the thing that is just completely mind blowing to me is that I wrote this poem a full seven years before I had a diagnosis. I wrote this poem about a different version of myself going to me and convince, convincing me to leave and, and getting me out of the abusive relationship. That's exactly what happened, that another version of me, one of my alters, another one of my identities came to me and got me to leave. Um, and that was just really incredible to me, the way that that information could be so accurate and so intact for so long and that I didn't I didn't know what it was, but it it existed there. Um, and that's really how dissociation works, that it um, compartmentalizes um, all these pieces of information um, in your head and makes it so that they aren't consistently accessible to you. Um, so that poem just has a lot of layers of meaning because of that. Um, and um, so that's where it comes from. Um, okay, so now we are transitioning into non-book poems. Um, so this uh, this first book book this first poem is called um, Pugliese, um, and this poem is kind of an, an intersection of three worlds that I come from. Um, the first one is the sort of trauma, mental health, abuse world that this that the book is about. Um, the second uh, world is Argentine tango. Um, some of you might know that uh, pre pandemic I ran a, a weekly Argentine tango dance. Um, and uh, I also DJed for it, and dancing was a really big part of my life for a long time. It was really important to me. Um, and then the third world in this poem um, is the world of disability and chronic pain, uh, because in 2014, um, chronic pain I had already been dealing with um, got to the point where it was debilitating, and I could no longer dance. I could only dance a single song every once in a while if I was feeling really good, and otherwise I couldn't. Um, and that was a really big loss. That was um, that was a really big shift to not be able to do that anymore. And I continued to uh, to run the dance and to DJ for the dance in order to maintain my connection to the community. Um, but um, but it was still hard to um, to not be able to join in dancing. Um, and so the name of this poem, Pugliese, refers to the name of a Argentine tango orchestra. Um, and Pugliese was um, was unique in terms of the time period that that orchestra was making music um, in that it was happening, um, it was being recorded at a time when Argentine tango music was moving away from being, uh, from having this sort of interdependent um, relationship to dancers, to being um, uh, exclusively uh, created and played for dancing to, um, and moving towards being more about artistic expression and experimentation and sort of for its own sake. Um, and so as a result, Pugliese is much harder to dance to than um, than most tango music is. Um, but the emotions are so evocative and strong that people do it anyways. <laughs> um, but uh, but it is very difficult. Hi, Amy again. Um, so at this point in the poetry reading, we played for you a recording of a dance performance to the song that this poem was originally inspired by, um, but we didn't have permission to record that and republish it on YouTube. Um, so instead, we're just going to play for you um, a recording of the song uh, that this poem was inspired by, Gallo Ciego, um, right after we read the poem to you. So here is the poem first called Pugliese. 
my grief in listening to music that I cannot dance to is just the feeling of my heart leaving my body as it soars across the dance floor, begging my feet to follow. It is the same pleasurable agony of missing the one you love. My brain places each step and says, oh, wouldn't it feel good to move this way? Naively seeking a reunion that will never arrive. But my affair with listening to Pugliese, the beast of the tango world that dancers study for years to master, is like having my body hurled across the room, against the walls, against the ceiling. It screams, why aren't you dancing? You will never be enough. You are not worthy. And yet I return to it, to be thrown again and again and again, a fractured soul with a battered body, returning to her abusive lover, how I long for the way Pugliese hurts me. So next poem, um, again, is sort of an intersection. This is between um, the world of abuse and trauma and, um, and the world of um, disability and chronic pain. Um, where do I want? There we go. That's what I want. 
um, this poem I wrote um, uh, a few years ago. Um, I uh, I strained the muscle in my forearm and then had a complication of that injury, um, which uh, which resulted in um, me not being able to to move my arm without excruciating pain. Even moving just my pinky a little bit um, would be incredibly painful. And so I had to take two weeks off of work. Um, I had to have friends come over and cook and clean for me because I just couldn't do any of it at all. Um, and um, and this poem um, came out of that time. This is called Sick Leave. When every defining char characteristic is taken from me, my loves, my likes, my have-dones, my will-dos, when my arms are limp and useless, my brain full of electricity, when my friends are pulled into the whirlwind of their lives, and I am the only still inactive thing. I am left with your grating voice in my head. As if I had been wearing all my accomplishments like a robe, holding them close to my body to cover the inadequacy underneath. And when my body grinds to a halt and I am stripped of every ounce of my value, underneath all of it, you are still there, raw and red on my naked skin. When all my joints are throbbing, I like to imagine that the sharp jabs and constant aches are something beautiful. It keeps me from circling round and round, my whole self sucked inevitably into the pain. But tonight I asked myself, what does my pain look like? It looks like the night sky filled with stars, where I am the black expanse of unending nothingness, and my pain appears as millions of balls of light. The shape of me is only visible by tracking the path of my pain. All right, next, I have something very special for you. I have a happy poem. My God, <laughs> it's not that I am not happy. It is not, it's not that I don't experience happiness in my life, but that um, I don't tend to express that happiness through poetry. Um, specifically. Oh, are we going to have a kitty interruption? Yes, we are. Hello. We have special guest. Special guest star Rosa is here. Okay, she's settling. Good. That's my emotional support animal, Rosa. She is basically always with me. Anyways, back to poetry. Um, so yes, this is a happy poem, one of the few. Um, so this poem is called Wingspan, and um, I wrote it um, a number of years ago. I wrote it uh, at uh, the very beginning of my relationship with my partner. Um, we're going to be celebrating, I think, our 12th anniversary at the end of November, I think. Um, uh, but this poem was written at the very beginning of this relationship. So this is Wingspan. I'm not sure I know where to find you. So much distance that wasn't there before. I smell you. Sparks of gold enter my lungs. The magic of our night comes back. I found you. I drop words into my poetry petri dish, hoping they'll grow into a poem of you. Curls, copper, eyelashes, stubble, hands, cupping, heart, head, hair, fluid, embrace, you. Eyes, like rivers, miles longer than I thought I would cross. So that's my happy poem for this reading. <laughs> this poem is called Always More Feathers, um, and it was part of a project that I was involved in a number of years ago called Original Weather um, that was organized primarily by uh, Laura LeHue, uh, poet Laura LeHue and um, artist Robert Tomlinson. Um, the project was um, that Robert made um, a series of paintings and um, a group of poets, including myself, um, uh, chose one or two uh, paintings and wrote poems in response to those paintings. Um, and um, those poems next to the corresponding paintings uh, were published in a book called Original Weather. And there was also an art exhibit that toured around. It was a very cool project to be part of. Um, and kind of as a sort of second wave after the main project, um, there were a few other paintings that that went around um, and Always More Feathers was written in, excuse me, 
in response to one of those. Unfortunately, I don't have the painting. I tried really hard to get a hold of it, um, but unfortunately, no one could find it. Um, and unfortunately, it's far too impressionistic um, for me to describe it to you based on my long memory of a project from 10 years ago. Um, but just know that this poem was um, was inspired um, by a painting. And after this is always more feathers, the poem. The earth, like a cannon, shot us out of her soil, covered in poetry. Her people fell in love with our wings, decorating themselves in pieces of our grace, feigning flight. After we came, our renewal was up to us. Expectations like chains, we funneled ourselves down, discovered our end, beauty used up. We take to the sky to speed us away from the ground. We fly to find a center worthy of us, whole and unheeding, each our own earth. Hi, this is Holly. Um, so in addition to this poem uh, being inspired by a physical uh, work of art, it also inspired a piece of music that a friend of ours wrote, uh, Kit Abrahamson. He wrote um, a piece for us to sing. Actually, we sang it about 10 years ago now. Um, and it was for voice, uh, Celtic harp, and alto flute. And uh, so I'm going to actually link to a video recording of that performance. Um, and I'm also going to link to uh, Kit Abrahamson's uh, current work because he has a new YouTube channel where he continues to release um, original music that he composed. So, um, so after, uh, so you can go listen to the uh, the music piece, Always More Feathers. And so I have one more poem for you guys, um, one last one, and. Um, this, uh, remember earlier I talked about that the second poem I wrote um, was in trying to describe why the relationship had been painful and that it all just kind of sprang fully formed um, in my head onto the page. And that's this poem. Um, it's also the last poem in the book. Um, and while I read this poem, I'm actually going to um, bring up the uh, the cover illustration um, for you to look at because um, because it is relevant to, to the content of the poem. So let's go ahead and do that. And there it is. So this is a better place. I was frail, like the remains of an old balloon, limp skin drained of life and buoyancy. You were so full of air, so big you took up the space that was mine every inch, no room. Leaving you, I'm expanding. My body rises up and up and up into a sky so terrible and breathes. So, that is the reading, that is the poetry reading. Um, uh, the last, uh, have last comments to make. Um, if, um, if you have enjoyed this poetry, if you enjoyed my work, if you don't already have the book, uh, you can buy it at bookstoread.com, uh, slash yap voice pet. That is, um, that link should be in the chat now. If you would like to read more of my writing, it's at yapvoice.com. Um, and I write about social justice issues and mental health and disability there. Um, if you would like to support my work more, you can join my Patreon. Um, I'm currently uh, creating bonus content about um, sort of inside look on the process of self-publishing this book. Um, so if you're interested in knowing about that process, uh, rewards start at $1 a month. Um, and uh, and in addition to the prints um, of the cover that you can get, um, I also sell other designs. I sell designs related to chronic illness and disability and also just cute animals um, on my Redbubble store on like t-shirts and mugs and things like that. Um, those links will be in the chat and you can also follow me on social media. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, and Pinterest. I am at Callahan on all the things. Um, so you can find me in any of those places. Um, so now we're going to transition um, into uh, Q&A and um, Phoebe is going to lead this. Um, so I'm going to let I'm going to let Phoebe explain um, what's happening. Hello, everyone. 
Uh, thank you for being here. I'm so happy that I got to be behind the scenes for a lot of the creation of this book from the beginning. And I've been in the background on Zoom today. So, uh, yeah, see what Kella has to teach us. Always so much, obviously. Not that I'm biased. <laughs> So my question was, you already answered so beautifully how you started writing this poetry, but I know you were already a poet before this. Mm -hmm. So I'm really interested in how you got started as a writer and as a poet, especially as a poet, but I'm interested in the answer about writer too. Yeah. Um, well, with writer, I feel like, uh, I just have kind of always been writing um, or in like second grade or something. We had an assignment um, to write and illustrate a book. And we actually, we got to like bind it up in a cover and everything. It was like, it was this whole thing. And it was supposed to be this big, long project. And I finished mine in like two days. <laughs> I was just like, bang, done. I was like, can I do another one? And so I ended up writing three books um, in the time that everyone else did one. So um, I just always like, wanted to write. I had things to say. I've always been journaling for, for years and years. Um, and, uh, and then poetry in particular, um, I think actually my first explorations of poetry, I don't know if I've told him this story, but I, uh, but, um, my dad is also a poet. Um, and I remember, um, seeing him, uh, write poetry and reading the poems and being like, I could do that, <laughs> which is no shade to him, of course. Um, he's a very talented poet. Um, but uh and so i just sort of started messing around with that um and then i think um i uh i went to college for just a few terms and um during that time i got interested in um in poetry more um because i was starting to write more and i was starting to sort of find what my more authentic writing voice was um and at the time it was hard for me to get that out it was hard for me to put a lot of words on the paper. I was still very sort of self-conscious about that. And I liked poetry as a medium because it was so efficient um, that I only needed a few words to say a lot of things. Um, and so I took um, I took a poetry class then and um, sort of honed skills that I already had started developing um, and got them a little bit more formalized. And then after that, I ended up joining um, a poetry group. Um, it was called uh, First and Third Poets. Um, and they were wonderful. They had a, um, a huge amount to do with the poems in this book. They did a lot of, of working with me on these poems. Um, and uh, that, was, that was kind of how that all started. Thank you. Um, no one's finding their voices yet to ask a specific question, but there's a lot of people that just shouted Rosa in Facebook. And by a lot of people, I do mean me. So can uh -huh. you show us Rosa again and see if anyone finds their voices in the meantime? Uh -huh. <laughs> uh, Rosa is uh, currently over um, eating some food. If she comes over this way, I'll make sure oh. to put her on camera. <laughs> well, she should have checked with me before making that move. I know. I know. She missed her cue. I'm sorry. She really did. <laughs> uh, well, the other question I wrote down, you kind of already answered okay. within that one because uh, you're just so thorough. <laughs> But do you want to explicitly tell us about the easiness of writing for you? Does it just come out or is it really hard? Yeah, um, no, actually, that is that is a more complex question um, because um, writing um, writing used to be very easy for me. And sometimes it is easy now. Um, I think certainly when I was writing this book, it was once I had kind of gotten over that first barrier um, and the poem started coming out, it was very easy. It was involuntary, if anything. Um, but, um, but over the last five years, actually writing got a lot harder. Um, I was dealing with a lot of health problems that caused brain fog. Um, I, uh, discovered that, um, white noise tends to, tra uh, trigger my brain fog. And I had to use, um, an air conditioner that was very loud, made a very loud white noise, uh, through all of the summer. And so I started, really losing the ability to focus for three or four months out of the year. Um, and I was also dealing with a lot of dissociation, which I didn't know. Um, and that definitely interfered with my ability to write and my sort of access to um, that like creative process and the ways that I had previously gone about writing something. Um, and that was very hard because um, I, uh, 
I had never encountered someone else. I, I had encountered writers that had taken breaks, but I had never encountered another writer that stopped writing because they couldn't, like not just writer's block or, you know, life events or whatever, but that that cognitively they could not write. Um, that was very new to me. And I didn't have a sort of reference of what of what that was like. Um, and actually I did experience, I did find another writer like that, um, a writer who um uh who published on my blog. His name is Mugabe. He's um uh he contacted me. We we found each other through a podcast about chronic illness. Um, and um in that podcast, he talked about um he has a uh I believe a neurological disorder um that's like a very rare one that people don't understand. Um, and that he um he had to find a form of writing that was accessible to him because he had literally just a few hours a day where he could focus on things, where he could interact with text at all. Um, and so he wrote this book and he wrote the whole thing in this sort of script format in like um, sort of like a text conversation. And he said that the reason that he wrote it that way was because it was accessible to him, was because that was a way that he could write, that he was capable of writing. Um, and so that was kind of my first um, experience with the idea of writing access accessibly and um, and having to figure that out on your own. Um, the good news is that, um, since I moved, um, just a few months ago, I now, uh, I now live in a new place that it has air conditioning. Um, there are a lot of things that are better about this, about this house that, uh, have been better for my mental health. And so, um, I basically, as soon as we moved, uh, my focus started improving a lot. Um, and so I've been writing a lot more. Um, I, you know, I've been able to, uh, do a lot of the work associated with this book because I got that focus back. Um, so, uh, so writing is starting to get easier now. It's still kind of in and out, uh, writing brain is still a bit of something we have to ration. Um, but, um, but it is, uh, slowly, slowly coming back and hopefully we'll just continue to do so. Wonderful. We have a question in the chat, and I mean Ooh. wonderful as in good answer and good where it's going. Not, wow, it's so great that writing is hard. <laughs> <laughs> but this question says, how would you describe the different experiences of writing a poem because of a need for self-expression and the experience of honing and organizing and publishing and sharing your poems? Oh, very interesting. Um... I think with um, with writing poems. So one of the reasons that I think that that our strength in writing is describing intangible things like feelings and ideas and concepts um, is because those things feel very tangible to me. Um, and so often, like in in therapy, I would um, you know my therapist would ask me a question, and I would have this feeling that was the answer, and it was like there was this sort of like glowing orb that was the feeling that was the idea and that there was this glowing thread that would connect to the orb. And so I would like follow the thread until I got to it. And then I'd be like, aha, I found it. This is the idea. Um, or sometimes um, I would follow the thread and I would like encounter a barrier and be like, well, the orb is underneath that pile of stuff that I need to work through first, but it's there. It exists. I know that there's a concrete answer to that question. Um, and so I think writing poems was kind of similar to that was it was, um, you know, identifying, identifying a feeling that I thought was important or was distinctive um, to, to the experiences that I had, um, and then following that thread and really trying to, to hone that and get as specific as possible um, about what the feeling was and what it meant. Um, and then um, the process of, um, of publishing it um, was, uh, was a lot more um, was a lot more removed from the emotional side of it, um, and in fact, like occasionally, I would sort of forget um, how dark the subject matter of this is, and how um, you know that there were some people who, when I shared it with them, they said, "Like, I'm so excited for your book. I cannot read it. I'm just not in a place where I can handle that right now." And that is completely understandable, but it would sort of surprise me because it it had sort of. Uh, gone into a place in my brain of just sort of this this thing that already existed and I wasn't interfacing it uh, interfacing with it on an emotional level as much anymore 
um, and instead thinking of it as this package, as this as um, as this collection of stuff that had had a meaning and had a value, and that I needed to figure out how to give it to other people. Um, and so I think that's that's the main difference between um, between those two processes. We have a wonderful, loving farewell from Jared. So wave to Jared, oh. and then I'll ask the other question. <laughs> Bye, Jared. Jared. Bye, Jared. Uh, and now another question was, you mentioned being in a poetry group. Do you currently have a writing community that you are a part of? Do you have suggestions for people who are looking for a writing community? That's a very good question. Um, I don't think I really have a writing community right now. Um, I am sort of part um, of a writing community on Twitter. The, the the Twitter writing community is extremely active. It's really the reason that I have as many followers on Twitter as I do is because of the writing community, that they are very um, into supporting each other and making sure that their each other's work um, gets seen. Um, but because for a long time I wasn't writing consistently, um, I didn't really feel like I could engage in that community in the same way that everyone was talking about all of these tips and tricks about, you know, how how to write more, how to write better, what, you know, what time of day do you write all these things? And it was like, I can't do that. <laughs> um, and so I couldn't really engage in the same way. Um, and so right now I feel like um, I don't have as much um, of a writing community that it's more like I have individual people um, who I trust with my writing, who I um, no understand of the writing process. Um, as far as advice goes, um, I think um, if you are able to um, go out into the world and um, and leave your house, um, looking to see, like looking online to see if there exists um, a local um, group, sorry, that was loud, um, if there exists a local uh, uh, writing group or poetry group, um, sometimes, um, sometimes if that's open to the public, that will be advertised. Um, so I recommend looking for that to see if it already exists. Um, if you know anyone that you know is already active in, um, in the poetry community, asking them, um, what they do, where they go, um, uh, where they listen to readings and that kind of thing, I think, um, can be a lead to that. Um, if you can't leave the house, um, if you stay at home most of the time, like I do, um, you actually have way more options. Um, and um, and so I actually, I feel like I have um, less specific advice to offer for that because online you can kind of go anywhere that, you know, that every social media platform has communities. Um, there are many websites um, that uh, that are dedicated to this kind of thing. And so it's a little bit you know, th there's a lot to sift through. Um, so again, I might try the same thing of talking to um, specific writers that you know and asking them, um, asking them which communities that they have resonated with, which ones they enjoy. Um, but otherwise, I would just sort of look around and try, just just engage with different different communities, see whether you like it or not. Um, and um, and if you don't, that's okay. There's another one. You know, if you if you don't find it enriching. Um, if you feel like it's like judgy or pretentious or something like that, or just not your thing, um, just try another one because there's there's always there's always more. There are many many communities um, online, um, and uh, and so that I think that's about as specific as as I can get with with uh, my recommendations on that. Hi, Boots. Yeah, Boots came over to say hi. Uh, he's very indignant because he doesn't know what daylight savings is, and right. he's it's past time for me to be fed. Oh, yeah. yes. Rosa's upset about that, too. I thought, I thought that might be the case. Uh, mm -hmm. So we have a question from Facebook. OK. Which is, I know you just published, so no pressure, but will you consider publishing more poems in book format? Mm, that is a good question. Um, I don't currently have a plan to do that, mainly because um, poetry isn't really the medium that I gravitate towards anymore. Uh, I, occasionally, a feeling strikes me and a poem is the way that I need to express it. Um, but a lot of the time now, I tend to express um, the types of things that I wanted to write about. I tend to express in um, in prose form instead, um, and um, so it is not impossible that I could uh, publish another book of poetry. I don't currently have enough poems that I would uh, that I would uh, see as as being good enough to be in a book, or that I would see as going together. Um, but uh, but if um, if I tapped into the sort of poetry expression again, if there were um, 
more things that I felt like lent themselves to being written that way, then I would absolutely consider it. It's just, I don't really have, um, I don't have enough material uh, currently to think that that is likely anytime soon. And my question that I've actually been asking you for months is how do I get my copy signed? I need a signed <laughs> copy of Pet. I, I'm going to come visit you, but how does everyone else get their copies? How, do, how does everyone else? Well, um, I don't have a good answer to that question. If you've already um, gotten your book, I'm not really sure, um, because probably it would just be a matter of like figuring out logistics of like shipping it to me and I sign it and, and ship it back and, you know, figure out the additional cost of that. Um, but I don't really know the details of that. If you haven't bought it yet, um, I am hoping to have that option. I am hoping I... Um, am I, I bought um a bunch of my own book <laughs> um at the at the um author price um and so i will have those available to sell to people in person and potentially sign them um and that could be a thing that i that i sell in person that could be a thing that i that i ship out to people if they specifically want a signed copy um but um so that's that is possible i don't know any of the logistics about it yet though <laughs> other than if you see me in person you can ask me to sign it and i will no, I think I'm going to advocate everyone just buys a second copy from the whatever the signing thing is and then has two or Do gives that. the first one to a friend who needs yes. it because a lot Excellent. of us have Excellent. needed this book. Upsell. Yes. Hey, I don't see any more text-based questions. I don't see hands raised. Boots is screaming though. Uh, you're okay, bud. <laughs> If I have missed you, please say something forthwith. Uh, or forever hold your peace. I mean, they could also just message you on Facebook. <laughs> yes, they, could. they could. Yes, I, I'm very, I'm very willing to answer questions. <laughs> and you have an email on Yacht, right? I do. Yes. Yes, that gets checked periodically. Yep, I have um, yapvoice at gmail dot com. Mm. Well, on uh, I'm going to let you, of course, do whatever you want to wrap up, but you mm -hmm. gave me a microphone. Yes. So you have to deal with the consequences. Oh, dear. OK. <laughs> I want to say from everyone that has been giving glowing love that we thank you and appreciate you mm -hmm. and are proud of you. And just thank you so much for sharing this time with us. And to hear your voice, both through your words and through your actual voice, mm -hmm. has been a privilege. Thank you. And I have to stop because I'm going to cry. <laughs> <laughs> I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. This is this has been a really amazing experience. This this book has already seen a lot of success. Um, we've already sold uh, 130 copies. Um, so, and that was more than we expected at, at this point in time. And we're still going to do a bunch of things for, for promoting it. We're still going to, um, enter it. Uh, we're going to submit it to like book bloggers and, um, and contests and things. So, um, um, so yeah, it's been a really amazing experience. The feedback so far has been amazing. Um, if you get a chance, it's very, very valuable to, um, to, uh, submit a review, um, particularly on Amazon and Goodreads. It's very valuable. Make your review honest, please. Um, <laughs> if you, if you say a hundred percent, you know, like this book was absolutely perfect and nothing was wrong with it. Amazon's not going to believe you. Um, but, um, and also, um, I, I request if you know me well, um, make sure not to mention that in the review because Amazon in particular is known to yeet reviews um, that uh, that they detect that there's like a personal connection between the people. So hopefully that doesn't happen, but just as, as a safe protection. But it really, really helps if you leave reviews on Amazon or Goodreads or wherever you bought the book from. It really, really helps our book get found by other people. Um, it helps with search results and um, and so forth. So um, So if you can do that, that would be a big help. Um, okay, so I think I think that is everything. As long as there aren't any more questions, I think we can we can wrap up and I'm gonna check Facebook one more time. And we can all Just... feed, feed our pets who are all upset. Okay, I think that's all the questions. Have a lovely evening, everyone.